The following is an Ice on Mars presentation. Missing Mile, North Carolina, in the summer of 1972, was scarcely more than a wide spot in the road. The main street was shaded by a few great spreading pecans and oaks, flanked by a few even larger, more sprawling southern homes, too far off any beaten path to have fallen to the scourge of the Civil War. The ravages and triumphs of the past decade seemed to have touched the town not at all, not at first glance. You might think that here was a place adrift in a gentler time, a place where peace reigned naturally, and did not have to be blazoned on banners or worn around the neck. So begins Drawing Blood by Poppy Z. Bright. This episode on... Dread Dialectic. Dread Dialectic. Hey everyone, and welcome to the fifth episode Woo-hoo. of Dread Dialectic. This is Michael T. Bradley. And this is Geeks Maddox. And today we're going to be talking about Drawing Blood. I plan to say that this is Drawing Blood by Poppy Z. Bright, because that's what it was written under at the time, and as I understand, Billy Martin, which is what who was once Poppy is going by now, seems to kind of refer to those books as essentially being written under a pseudonym. Though I am going to try to use masculine pronouns, because Billy has transitioned and is, is male. Ah, uh, that sounds fair. And from non-gender politics standing, using the name it was written by is is kind of the standard. And I tried searching around to see if I could find anything more definitive than just a few quotes here and there. And if you go to poppyzbright.com, it is hilariously out of date. <laughs> it looks like a GeoCities page, <laughs> like it's green background and flashing and everything. So be sure to check that out. Poppy Z. Bright is an author who I enjoyed a lot when I was younger. Um, did you know that Poppy wrote a Crow book? No. I actually only knew Poppy from queer politics. I, I didn't know he was a fiction author at all until you recommended this book. Oh, really? Yeah. Uh, I, I didn't even know that he had uh, done any sort of writing of that sort. Yeah, well, we are of different worlds, you and I. Before we go any further, I want to go ahead and plug, if you have feedback, questions, suggestions, or submissions, things that you would like us to read, we're looking for novels and novellas from uh, lesser-known authors, dread.dialectic at gmail.com. That's dreaddialectic at gmail.com with a period in between the two words. First, let's go ahead and start out with a plot synopsis. Zack is a 19-year-old Leet Haxor on the run from the authorities. He stops off in the small, sleepy town of Missing Mile, North Dakota, where he meets Trevor. North Carolina. What did I say? North Dakota. <laughs> North Carolina. Where he meets Trevor, a troubled young artist who is literally haunted by his past. Zack believes sex is for fun, but you never have it with someone you care about. Trevor is about to break down all those preconceptions. Trevor has never had any sort of... uh, Now I've lost... I've totally lost my, like, back of a romance novel voice. And so uh, Trevor... Trevor has never had any sort of relationship in general because he grew up in a foster home and kind of the weird kid because his family was murdered when he was very young. And he's actually in Missing Mile... To go back to the house where it happened, because he is trying to figure out the mystery of why his father let him live, but killed his mother and his brother. They're both in for much more than they bargained for. (laughs) And possibly love? And also some extra friends and lots of weed. So, there's that. Rather a lot of Trigger warnings that we have. Uh, I mean, sexual content, but you you got that from, from up to now, I think. Um... I mean, we are a horror genre, so cannibalism shouldn't be a surprise. <laughs> yeah, dr- drug use and, and sexual content are the only things I can think of. I'd say that's it. Let's go through. We're going to do the good, the bad, and the ugly. The good, we l- talk about what we liked. The bad, we talk about what we disliked. And then the ugly is the monster at the end of the book where we will get into spoiler territory. Mm-hmm. So let's go ahead and uh, start with the good. Skix, you want to start us off there? The language is consistently interesting and, pardon the pun, bright. Despite having a, a dark topic, the, the tone tends to not be all that dark. Uh, and I find that easy to read and enjoyable. 
The characters are interesting and varied and well thought out. The conjunction of the two leads doesn't feel forced, even though it happens over a very short time. Once we get into the real horrific part, the imagery is just interesting. I know a lot of people use that as damning with faint praise, but but for me, interesting is definitely an important word, and I, I it's just interesting. It's unusual, unexpected, and 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 interesting. <laughs> I, I definitely agree with the first part, and I, I should go ahead and say that I suggested this book. I, I think I mentioned, you know, that I was a fan of Poppy's vi- fiction from way back, Lost Souls. It was kind of a groundbreaking thing in horror, at least the horror scene of the early, late 80s, early 90s. You know, they mention ghosts and ghosts span lost souls, with a question mark at the end yeah. uh, a few times in there. Her book before, or his book before this was uh, uh, was about those characters. Oh, neat. And um, I think vampires were involved somehow. It's been well, it's very, very long since I've read it. We very nearly went to vampires at the at the concert, uh, so I'm not <laughs> surprised. For sure. But no, I, I definitely agree that the language is very easygoing and very light, and uh, there are a lot of kind of in-jokey sort of things, and, and it's almost as if Poppy at times is kind of wink-nodding at the audience, like, you get this, right? And so that makes it very, very quick and very easy to read. Right. I saw a quote because I was, when I was trying to find out more about Poppy's, like, preferred pronouns and how to refer to him and yada, yada, yada correctly and respectfully. I saw this quote talking about how Poppy came on the scene and it was almost like a kind of a taking Anne Rice and shaking her and, like, forcing that to grow up because they were like, uh, this this person said Anne Rice's characters were homoerotic and Poppy's characters were homosexual. <laughs> and and that was just such a, a big thing for me as a 14-year-old, you know, cisgendered white male living in the middle of rural Missouri. Just seeing something like this and how... I, I don't know how to say it because it, it's like, especially for younger people now, it's like, well, duh. But reading this and it's like, it's not a thing. It's, it's not like Trevor, who seems kind of uncertain of his sexuality because he's never really interacted with anyone. There's no, like, conversation where he's like, am I gay now? And what does this mean? And what does it say about me? It's just, it's about, I really like this person and I like being physical with them and I think I'm in love. And there, you know what I mean? Like, there's no... The relationship conflict is about the haunting and, and, and things tied to that, not about gay angst. And that was nice. Technically, uh, I believe uh, Zach is bi, or of sure. no one ever says the B word, but he dates some girls, but mostly boys. He's bi or pan or something like that. And and Trevor might be as well, right? I yeah, mean, who knows? Yeah, Trevor just seems to be connecting. But for all intents and purposes, we have two male characters in a physical and uh, romantic relationship, and it, and it's just, it's not... Like, that's not made a thing. And now, of course, I'm making it a thing by talking about it. But uh, as I say, especially for a uh, someone from the background I was from and the age I was at, that was like a huge deal for me. Uh, so I thought it was cool. And it, it I, <laughs> I thought it was amusing. One, one of the quotes that I separated here is how, like, one of the few times that this is kind of brought up is uh, it's, it's like straight people don't see gay people flirting. Uh, Kinsey is is trying to ask. Uh, Kinsey's a guy who owns the local bar slash nightclub, and he is trying to get Zach. This is before Zach and Trevor have met. He's trying to get Zach to go deliver some goods to him, and he says he doesn't bite. And Zach says, "Oh well, then forget it." And he, uh, Zach saw Kinsey's blank look. Sorry, and it's like Kinsey just doesn't even get it. Yet, I mean, Kinsey doesn't care. I mean, Kinsey eventually realizes that they have a relationship, and he doesn't care or whatever. It's like how in commercials, men can't see yogurt. <laughs> yeah, I like that. And in this universe, at least, uh, straight people can't see gay flirting. That so. means we're the ones with the culture. <laughs> but um, I definitely agree with you on that point. The fact that we have gay characters or queer characters... And it's not a story about being gay bashed. It's not a story about AIDS. It's not a story about internalized homophobia. It's not a story about coming out. It's a story about a haunted house. So let's tackle the bad. We fail the Bechdel test, which is a little surprising. (laughs) 
we've got essentially one female character, and I don't think she even talks to herself. Her motivation is entirely Zack-centered. Mm. But i not really fond of Eddie's character. I think we didn't have the relationship between her and Zack set enough so that when she had a meltdown toward the end that it felt okay. Because to me, it felt like she was being just spoiled and terrible. She got over it fast, which is lovely, but... The authorial voice seemed to think she was doing okay, but I thought she was being a jerk. <laughs> Honestly, Eddie could have been removed from the story. Yeah. Zack was planning to leave anyway. Essentially, Eddie comes and says, no, they're super really after you. Fetus has more impact on the story, and he has far fewer lines and far less screen time. True. Fetus is a, a fellow hacker who gets nabbed by the FBI and kind of uh, turns uh, stool pigeon and tries to help them find Zack, who is, like, hacker enemy number one. I thought that was a little odd, because Fetus seemed to have no reason to do so. Yeah. Like, why is he still feeding them information after they're done questioning him? I can see them easily cracking this kid, but then after that, for him to go back and be like, I think he's in Missing Mile, North Carolina, I don't, I don't get it. I have a minor quibble <laughs> that I want to make a point of, because it just kept annoying the shit out of me. Okay. What color is Trevor's hair? Trevor was ginger. Zack had black hair. Trevor is ginger, except when Zack is looking at him. Then he has fine blonde hairs. <laughs> yes. Zack took handfuls of Trevor's hair and pulled it over their faces. The effect was like being inside a sheer tent or a tawny ginger cocoon. Like, every time that we see Trevor, he's got ginger hair, except in the first large segment where Zack's looking at him and I just found one section the sun had bleached Trevor's hair pale blonde. I, I mean I guess they're saying the sun has bleached it and ah damn. But also some of the blonde hairs are on his lower back I don't think the sun bleached those. Also location 2350 on the Kindle version, long blonde hair hmm. I'm not sure if Poppy knows what ginger means <laughs> You know that's possible because I don't recall him ever saying reddish or copper or yeah, Any of those things yeah. you normally uh, uh, combine with that. My big issue with this, and I don't even know if it's necessarily a negative, but it really just made me kind of wince about being 14 years old, is I loved this book when I was 14, and reading it now, I just kept laughing, because reading this feels like reading fan fiction now. Like, that's what it felt like to me. It felt so like, look at all these references that I can make in this book. Look at all these ways that I'm super cool, right? And all of these kind of silly, overwritten moments that pulled me out of it. Like, uh, just a couple of ones that I highlighted. Zack felt a million possibilities starting to unfold within him like a garden of dark flowers. And it's like, a garden of dark flowers is a great image, but if they're possibilities, why are they dark? What, you know, what's the, like, it, it just felt like some of these things where it's like, look, I'm a writer, you know? And uh, another favorite was, her heart was not just breaking, but imploding. <laughs> yeah. Okay, one last one. Trevor thought he could feel their very souls, their molten cores of pain, flowing together like white-hot metals. And it's just, there's so much of that writing in here. And I'm like, it, I still overall enjoyed it. But I was just like, oh man, you know, like this, it reminded me of when I was 14. And it felt like a fellow 14 year old had written it in many ways. Yeah. Poppy was probably writing for his friends. Sure. Yeah, uh, definitely. Oh, and then, you know, the whole like entire scene devoted to Zach uh, filling in as a singer in a rock band and basically then just Trevor being like, oh my god, you're so hot up there, I want to fuck you. <laughs> and it just, it felt so much like we were reading kind of a fan fiction of, I don't know, like these were two Yu-Gi-Oh characters, right? I, and we're reading this like slash fic. I, I would like to insert uh, about that scene though, the uh, the other guy who hit on Zack, that went fine. <laughs> It was sort of setting up for a, a cheating subplot, or at least a, a love triangle subplot, or or a misunderstanding subplot, and mm -hmm. no, Zach said, no, wait, wait, no, 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 I, I love this other dude, and the guy goes, oh, okay. Well, that's... I was actually thinking it might turn into a rape subplot. Again, much like fan fiction, basically everything in this book is kind of like, uh, and then it just fizzles out, you know? Like, that could have been... 
ten types of different conflicts that we have to solve, and instead it's just like, no, I'm going to stick with Trevor. But and similarly... I hate every kind of conflict that could have turned into. <laughs> I, I approve similar, of this outcome, personally. Similarly, with the agents hunting down Zack, it's like... That could have turned... I thought that was going to turn into some massive gunfight or something, because it's been so long since I they read never it. never even I met. I remember many of the details. Yeah, and they never even meet. It's just like, no, they just get away. There was really no point to the agents being in town whatsoever, because it doesn't, you know... It, it, like, this book is just like, oh, God, no conflict. Please stay away. Right. And, I mean, it's unique in that sense. It's like Star Trek, right? The only conflict is inner conflict. Sure. And their inner conflict is pretty dramatic, have it be said. What if someday he opened a sketchbook and his hand went stiff, his mind numb? That's the other thing. I don't think Poppy has any idea how long it takes to actually draw things. Mm -hmm. Because Trevor is drawing entire, like, eight-page comic books in an evening. Right. <laughs> and I'm like, no, that's... No, honey, that doesn't... You know. <laughs> That's an ungendered honey, by the way, just to, just to be clear. I, um, I prefer ungendered honey. Uh, you got to go to the specialty market, though. <laughs> That's pre-B, somehow. <laughs> All right, so let's talk about the ugly. Now, when we talk about the ugly, there will be spoilers. So if you're interested in reading the book from what we said, probably best to turn it off now and come back later. Uh, but yeah, let's talk about the monster at the end of the book and anything spoiler-related that kind of relates to any of the conversations we've been having so far. The monster at the end of the book is arguably a place or a memory or a time loop. There's a lot that's not explained. It's essentially a Star Trek Voyager plot, is what it is, at the end of the day, because it's all about a time paradox. If you believe it to be literally true. It is implied through heavy usages of drugs at almost every point where something happens that's uh, paranormal that this could all be in their minds, right? A folie a do. Yep. But that's no fun. Let's... Well, I liked Birdland. I liked the idea that it really exists in some fashion. The, yeah. The time loop doesn't honestly interest me that much. It doesn't answer the question. It it, it begs the question in the original meaning of the, mm -hmm. the phrase. Yeah. But, uh, but Birdland is interesting and the characters in in Birdland are interesting, and I, I could have done with a bit more of that. I would like both of the boys to be in the same space in Birdland so they can interact with each other as well as these various demons from their own past. I had forgotten about Birdland because it is such a small part of the entire thing, and really the book should have been called Birdland, except for the fact that drawing blood is such a good play on words when your main character is an artist. Except it, I, I was finished with the book before I realized the pun. <laughs> <laughs> so Birdland is either this mental construct that's a folie a do, or it is a place that Zack's dad might be trapped because he's an artist. And it and it the thing that I found most interesting is that it, they say at one point that it feeds off of artists. It kind of reminded me of the cartoon world in Cool World, like it's this very '30s sort of happening place uh, where your demons live and yeah i really thought there was so much potential with this we see so many little things like trevor meets zach's mom right uh, and zach gets beaten up by his dad with a bag of diamonds <laughs> i wanted the different characters you know like like it would be like uh like some sort of dc versus marvel crossover or something you know like like they're only able to beat each other's yeah. demons by tag teaming or something. And the, the I mean, we're using demon uh, a bit lightly, but they're, they're people from their past sort of... Inner demons. Inner demons. And they're all warped somewhat, and they all kind of crumble or, or rot at some point. It's, it's interesting, and it, you're right, it could have gone further. I think... See, when we finally met the artist's dad... He was in the house. He wasn't out in Birdland, and I, I, I want to see him out there. Because he's he's apparently kind of self-tortured time loop hell. But I feel, my my opinion of, of the metaphysics of this thing is that Birdland is a place that pre-existed. That yeah. Dad tapped into it, and it took form from his comics, and somehow it enticed the Dad to do the murders and suicide, but I think the seeds of that had to have been inside him somewhere. I mean, he's an alcoholic, and that tends to, you know, be a, a bad sign and that sort of thing. really felt like maybe 
Poppy wrote this with not a clear ending in mind, and he was like, yeah, it'll, it'll, I'll, I'll figure something out by the end. Remember the, uh, uh, the other townspeople uh, who, when they were kids, went into the house? Each of them saw a piece of Birdland, too. Again, assuming that people aren't lying or hallucinating. Uh, if they are hallucinating, it's definitely a joint hallucination, and that's weird anyway. But there's some right. truth to Birdland as, as it appears, it seems. Then there's also the fact that Birdland isn't necessarily always evil, if, if, if we're, we're assuming that it's a real thing, which I say it's boring to assume that it's just psilocybin and so on and so forth, but um, if we're assuming that it's a real thing, it sent off Trevor's comic that he drew to Steve Bissett at Taboo. Yeah, that was weird. Yeah, and so Steve's like, hey, I love it, this is awesome. I think it was sort of implied that Trevor's dad drew that strip more than he did, because uh, there's a note earlier that says that, like, Trevor's dad could capture the wet look of hair better. Right. And then the descriptions in the comic are described as having that wet look of hair uh, on, on some panels. And yeah, that's a nice touch. Maybe the reason that that happened is because Trevor's dad wanted to be seen again, but... In, in the bits that we get at the beginning where he's alive, he never really seemed to want that. Uh, so I think that since it, it, Birdland feeds off the artists, I think Birdland feeds off the fame. So that, that comic has to get published or Birdland gets nothing. That's what I think. Who knows? Uh, there, yeah, there are definitely... That whole blood transfusion scene was just grotesque. When uh, in, in Birdland, uh, very early on, uh, when the junkie... Oh, Skeleton Sam. Skeleton Sam. Sam how he, he got blood from Trevor using a dirty needle. And then oh, he just yeah, sort of yeah. died before he could answer Trevor's question. <laughs> That's... You could learn a lot from a junkie. <laughs> sure. So, so, I mean, ultimately, there are some horror moments and some real grotesque stuff. It's not actually all that scary. There's some menacing moments. There's some... What the fuck moments, but uh, I think this is straight up absolutely just a romance novel, and a couple of creepy images are yeah. thrown in here and there. But it's nothing more than I think maybe if you took out the uh, blood semen spout scene and you took out the skeleton Sam deflating scene, you would have no more than a scene in a typical romance story. Well, the uh, attempted I, cannibalism does go a little far for a romance novel. I mean, I just saw that as, you know, wacky foreplay. I mean, well, that's... also some of the some of the, the, the running monologue on that, like, you know, I'm gonna eat your heart, or I'm gonna, you know, uh, put my hands into your guts up to my elbows. And... They just seemed really gothy to me. I mean, it's like, oh, I wanna dig my hands into your entrails and make out with you in a cemetery. It's less gothy when he's actually in the process of trying to kill him, though. <laughs> it's gothy music video I mean, uh, I, I have a question for you. Yeah. Uh, as a 14-year-old from your, your background, how were you affected by the gay sex scene? Did that bother you? No. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> um, you know, I, I'm, I'm just curious because, you know, I, I grow up and any, anytime there's a romance and there's a sex scene, you know, it's clearly not written for me and and i'm not offended or horrified by it but i know people are more likely to be horrified by by gay shit so <laughs> honestly it was like uh, this is a little odd but okay no it, it was just weird to me i think mostly because zach is kind of a slut without being uh, the typical slut in a horror movie right? right and so that was a little weird i mean like so preternaturally immune to uh STIs, apparently. Yeah, that was another thing. Like, this guy was a slut in New Orleans in the late 80s, and it seems like I'm kind of shocked that there was no, not even a mention of, a, of an AIDS scare or anything like that, right? I, I mean, he had sort of a passing thought that, that he and Trevor should go to a clinic at some point. Honestly, I mean, I understand the, the, the time and the place and being 19, but honestly, he should have been tested before he stuck his dick in anyone. I mean, that, that just holds true for anybody out there listening. I mean, unless you're 
a virgin, I guess, then, you know, I, I, and virginity is a concept that is biologically meaningless, but uh, unless you haven't stuck your dick in anyone before that in any way, shape, or form, probably get tested before you stick it in someone else. Uh, also true for people without dicks. Yes. No matter how many dicks you are, get tested. So, let's ask the question, would you recommend this, Skex? Absolutely, have already done so. I'll admit, I, I think I would say no unless I knew somebody who was a goth. And then I would be like, <laughs> dude, you have to check out this book. It's because I, I keep saying I, that, I did not read it as goth at all. That, that was not really... Yeah. Oh, man. Like, I mean, you know, they talk about how Zack looks like Edward Scissorhands, and so sure. I just picture him uh, as Edward Scissorhands slash the Sandman from Neil Gaiman, you know, and there are just all of these references to things a like... little matrix because he's, he's the super hacker who actually gets to fly through a visualization of cyberspace. I just felt like this was written for the goth that I wanted to be and absolutely wasn't at 14. I wish I had read this at 14. Yeah, so this was this was a fun read. It was fun going back uh, nearly a quarter of a century and taking a look at this again um, and, uh, yeah, peering into, uh, into that mindset. So, again, uh, uh, the name that this author goes by now is Billy Martin. I don't believe he's writing anything anymore. For a while, he was writing books about uh, chefs in New Orleans. I think he's kind of past the writing part, but I don't know. Even if you search Poppy Z. Bright, it's going to come up as Billy Martin. You can find out more about him if you want. I remember some of the crazy shit that he wrote. He wrote a uh, an ode to William Burroughs' corpse. It was all about making love to William Burroughs' corpse oh, nice. um, when William Burroughs died. That was weird. Burroughs would have loved it, though, I'm sure. Yeah, he wrote a short story about getting raped by Matt Stone and Trey Parker. Huh. I think Billy seems like an interesting character, and uh, I think it would be fun to hang out and have a, a long lunch with him. As a reminder, the address to send us thoughts, feedbacks, comments, uh, or whatever is dread.dialectic at gmail.com. We are interested in submissions, novels, or novellas, please. Uh, no uh, collections of short stories, poetry, anything like that. Um, not really something that lends itself to this sort of format very easily. For now, this is Michael T. Bradley. And this is Skixmatics. And we are... 